Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you, uh, welcome you all on behalf of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace to this afternoon's program. Um, and I would especially extend a warm welcome to Dr. David Palmer, who has traveled from China and has been attending a conference and working on another book um, uh, with a co-author in this country uh, who is here today to deliver this uh, very interesting lecture. Um, the, the lecture examines, if I may just say briefly a little bit about it, uh, the feat, it lectures an important feature of modern Chinese, Chinese uh, world, if you will. Uh, and by that I mean that it basically places religion in modern China. <clears throat> and our speaker is quite um, versed in this topic. He has written many articles, many books on this subject. Uh, and I'd like to just bring to your attention a book that he has written, co-authored with uh, Dr. Vincent Gossart uh, in France uh, called The Religious Question in Modern China, published by the University of Chicago Press, which has really received wide attention, has already received one award that I'm aware of, uh, and is praised for its very rigorous interdisciplinary approach um, to a very important topic that has not often always been understood properly, which is the place of religion in Chinese society. The Times Literary Supplement wrote the following about this seminal book. The sheer scope of the author's research and their ability to channel formidably differ, diverse material into a cogent narrative make for a masterly summation of the changes in China's religious landscape over the past century. What is unique about Dr. Palmer's approach to his subject matter is the manner in which he pieces together the puzzle of religion in China not by looking separately at different religions in different contexts, but by writing a unified story of how religion has shaped and in turn been shaped by modern Chinese society. So I'd like to just say a little bit about his background before I ask him to come up here and make his presentation. Dr. David A. Palmer is Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Hong Kong, an honorary associate professor at Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Trained at the Institute for Research, for Advanced Research at Sorbonne University in Paris. He was formerly the Eileen Barker Fellow in Religion and Contemporary Society at the London School of Economics and Political Science and from 2004 to 2008, director of the Hong Kong Center of the French School of Asian Studies located in the Institute for Chinese Studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is the author of numerous books, and one of them is Qigong Fever, Body, Science, and Utopia in China, published by Columbia Pre University Press. He co-authored, as I said, The Religious Question in Modern China, and has co-authored another uh, book of Chinese religious life uh, by Oxford Press. He has published several articles, journal issues, and edited volumes on Chinese religion, modern Taoism, the Baha'i faith, and modern religious movements. His current research projects focus on local rituals, ritual traditions, transnational religious movements, and on faith-based volunteering and NGOs in the Chinese world and Southeast Asia. Please joining, join me in welcoming Dr. Palmer to today's lecture, please. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Mahmoudi. 
I, um, when I arrived in the campus today, I saw these signs which referred to turtles, <laughs> and I wasn't really sure what was going on, what the joke was here. And then I learned that the turtle is the mascot of the University of Maryland. And I thought that that, and I saw actually right outside this library and at another spot, a turtle right there in the middle, well worn because people have been um, touching the turtle for good luck before exams. And I thought, well, this is so interesting because the turtle is a very auspicious animal in China. And you will see the same kind of thing in China. Now, why is the turtle so auspicious? because the turtle combines heaven and earth. So the, uh, when you look at the turtle shell, the bottom part is square and the top part is round. So the bottom square part represents the earth, the top round part of the turtle represents heaven. And so the turtle itself combines heaven and earth, the spiritual and the material forming one well-protected world. Actually, this talk today is it's about how this turtle is constructed. In other words, it's about how do you bring together two completely different things? How do you bring together the square and the circle? How do you combine the square and the circle to construct a larger composite entity. So what I'm going to do in the talk today is I'll start just to put us into the mood. I'll show a few minutes of video of a local ritual going on in rural China, in northern Guangdong province, where I've done some field research, which will just give us an idea of some uh, traditional forms of religion in China and, and which will raise a question which is then the question that this uh, talk aims to address, which is the question of religious pluralism. Because as it is well known, the Chinese are known to be syncretistic, quote unquote, uh, to mix all kinds of religion together. And so the question is, well, what are they really doing? Is there any logic to what they're doing? And how does this compare to uh, religious pluralism as we understand it in the West? So I'll begin by, after showing the video, I'll begin by just discussing the, the, what is a certain conventional understanding of religion, of, of pluralism, and I'll look at how that applies in the West very briefly before then looking at the Chinese case. And I'll be showing how the, in the Chinese culture, um, pluralism is not about um, the, uh, the respectful interactions between entirely separate entities, but it is really about the constructive interactions between very different entities. And I'll look at three different models of this type of construction which we can see in China. And these three are only three of many other possible models. And the reason I'm showing this is within the mission of the Baha'i uh, Chair for World Peace is really to, it's just to open our minds to think about how we can um, imagine different ways of peacefully constructing unities out of diverse elements. Now, um, Okay, there's so much to say about this, but there's just one point that is related to my topic today. I mentioned that there are two altars at this ritual space. One is called the civil altar, the Wen Tan, and the other one is called the martial altar. Now in South China, in rural South China, throughout South and Southeast China, Guangdong, Fujian, Anhui, and, uh, and other provinces of Southern China, communal rituals, usually have two altars in such fashion. Uh, they, one may be bigger than the other, so on, but you, there is normally at least those, those two elements, the civil and the martial, will be there. Now, the civil altar in this ritual is Buddhist. 
the martial altar is Taoist. So you have the two different religious traditions which are combined in the single ritual. But not only that, in fact, we saw some priests. I mentioned uh, some priests who were reading sutras at the civil altar, and then there was the priest withholding the chicken uh, at the martial altar. So I said that was a Taoist priest, and early it was a Buddhist priest. But in fact, these are the same priests, the same troop of priests, so uh, who can literally change hats. And actually, when they were at the civil altar, he was wearing a hat, and the hat said, for Buddhist. OK, so just in case you were to avoid you getting confused, he has his hat that says Buddhist, and he could switch, uh, literally switch hats. So can you imagine now um, a, a service where you had a Christian service going on on this side and a Muslim service going on on that side, and where actually the same person could play the role of the imam on one side and of the pastor on the other. And this is what often seems to be very intriguing uh, uh, for um, people outside of China. And in fact, it's also very intriguing for many people in China because the concept of religion, which they have now absorbed in their education, is one which comes from the West, where religion, by definition, must be exclusive and separate. So it's unimaginable for the same person to be a rabbi and a a Catholic priest, for example, and yet here that's exactly the situation that we see. So this is the question then that leads me to open up this discussion on pluralism. Now, a conventional view of pluralism is really a view where we have um, several completely distinct internally unified units one, two, three, four, and which basically recognize and tolerate each other's existence side by side. They are side by side, but they are completely distinct from each other. And so when we talk about an increasingly pluralistic society, that's usually, and how we should promote pluralism, that's usually what we're talking about. We're saying, well, yes, we have many individuals who are very different from each other, so we've got to learn how to live together with them to accept, to accept their existence as they are, uh, but they are they and I am I. And so we are separate. We live, in a plural, we, under, we live in an understanding of pluralism, so I won't try to impose my views on others. They won't impose themselves on me, but you know, it's, they are completely separate entities. So it can be individuals or it can be religions too. So in a religiously pluralistic environment, religions learn to in fact, they're learning to move away from a model where there's only one circle there, me, my religion, and I want to monopolize everything. And so now we have to learn that, oh, well, actually, we are many religions side by side, uh, acknowledging and tolerating each other's existence. But this is, so this is what I would say is a conventional view of pluralism, which comes from a Western, um, uh, a Western history. But I'd like to really question this idea, um, because this idea is really based on, in a sense, a notion of uh, a pluralism of completely separate, undifferentiated units. And I would rather, the, I think the Chinese case, however, can um, let us consider the idea of composites, that everything is actually composed or made up of different elements. And actually, this is the, the reality of the physical world and the reality of the social world. Everything is composed, every, every um, united existence or every being, whether it's a physical being, a human being, or a social being, is in fact a combination of different elements. So if we look at the human body, we're looking at the, the combination of completely different um, organs and elements which come together to form the human body. Now, if we look at any social body, it's actually, in, in fact, I find a little um, interesting that um, we still tend to see social units, such as ethnic groups, such as religions, such as organizations, 
as single undifferentiated units, whereas in fact they are composites. And so that's what I'd really like to explore in this talk then, is how do we uh, look at um, a pluralism which, const which constructs composites. So I just gave a certain conventional model of pluralism, but in fact in the West what we're looking at is not, uh, as we saw, several balls of equal dimension side by side, but actually what we're looking at is one big item uh, in, the, in the field of religion surrounded by many small ones. What do I mean by that is that in all Western countries and in also most uh, Muslim countries, so basically in the Christian and Islamic world, what we have is every country has one single dominant religion, one single dominant religious tradition. And every other religious tradition, um, even in a context of pluralism, needs to uh, find its space, but always in adaptation to and in relation to that dominant one. So that, for example, in uh, North America, we see many minority religions have adopted many of the forms of Christianity. So we have, for example, Buddhist church, which meets every Sunday. Uh, and in fact, so many sociological researches have shown that there is a tendency in the United States for non-Christian religions to follow Christian organizational forms. So the, the pluralism is actually several balls of the same color, but they actually are structurally pretty much the same. They're just of different colors. They're different flags, but the flag is the same shape. And so this is really the type of plural, the so-called pluralism which we see in much of the Western world or, and also of the Islamic world. Um, now, in China, however, we're in a very diff different situation because China does not have and never has had one single hegemonic dominant religious tradition which has been able to impose its structure, its norms on the totality of society. And so that's why China is a fascinating case for the study of pluralism. What happens when it's not this, several little minorities trying to find their space and adapt to one large uh, majority, but when you have several different traditions which are actually ontologically and structurally very different from each other and then they come and what happens when they interact with each other. So there are three different, as I mentioned, I'll talk about three different patterns or models by which they come together. And one is what we call the san jiao he yi, the unity of the three teachings. Now this is well known in China. So China has three major traditions of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. And over uh, the uh, around 2,000 years, these different traditions over time have really learned to coexist. So everybody knows that. Um, and I'd just like to expand a little on the structure of this, that all three of these traditions in some way or another, um, to different degrees, have advocated this idea, um, have advocated the common, the coexistence of the three teachings, and the Chinese emperor himself uh, also was an advocate of this idea. So a certain consensus has come into being about the unity of these three teachings. Um, now, how does this play out? And I'd like to uh, suggest that we look at how this plays out from different perspectives. So the first perspective is from the people, just the common people, right? So right in the middle of this diagram here, we have the common people who do not identify with a single one of these three traditions. The majority, the vast majority of them, are neither, would neither identify as Buddhist, nor as Taoist, nor as Confucian. And um, however, they go to, um, or they make use of, in different contexts and at different times, of Buddhist 
of Taoist and of Confucian um, practices, values, um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and social norms. And this can be seen at many levels by many people, uh, at many levels of society. So, for example, at the intellectual level, it is often said, for example, that well, the the Mandarin, right, the the the, the Confucian, the the well-educated scholar official. So, at, at work, he is a Confucian, and uh, he uses the Confucian teachings. Uh, to, to consider how to act as an administrator and what are the moral values and norms, what are the ideals, and what are the methods of dealing with, with, um, uh, with uh, the subjects of the emperor. And so Confucianism will be used. So at work, he's a Confucian, so to speak. But then when he's kind of under the pressure of these institutions and uh, he's... Uh, um, uh, and his own personal ideas are kind of not being well respected, even when sometimes he is unjustly criticized or persecuted, then he becomes a Taoist. So he's a Taoist in his own private studio in his mansion, and there he engages in meditation, um, in poetry, and so in the free, uh, uh, as a free dreamer like Zhuangzi. Um, and then when his um, family member, somebody in the family dies, then he becomes a Buddhist because it is Buddhism which really has the most to say about the afterlife. And so uh, in order to en ensure a better uh, reincarnation of the future uh, of the family member, he will call on Buddhist priests. And of course, in the family relations, again, he will, con he will turn to Confucianism in terms of his filial piety, his um, um, uh, how to conduct mourning, uh, and how to manage the relationships between family members. So this is one way in which um, uh, the, so we can see that the different traditional traditions have a certain functional uh, differentiation. Uh, now, that was at the level of the intellectual. Now, if we looked at the level of the common person, the farmer, it, there would also be. So Confucian values are really what structures the family relations. Um, Buddhism, so Buddhists will be, Buddhist monks would be called on often to conduct funerals, and Taoists will be called on to conduct healing rituals um, and other rituals for protection against uh, misfortunes. And so what we can see then in this from the perspective of normal people is that Buddhism, Taoism, and the, the three different traditions are in a sense seen as different systems of knowledge, each of which has uh, different uh, strong points or different areas of specialization. Uh, so Buddhism has focused more on the, uh, uh, on the life of the mind and also on the, uh, on the afterlife. Um, Taoism has focused more on the life of the body, the health, health cultivation, um, and also dealing with spiritual worlds, whereas Confucianism has focused more on the arts of managing the family and the country. So all of these, these really, and so different specialists, so the Confucian scholar, um, right, the Confucian, the Buddhist monk, the Taoist priest, they all have a very strong identity that they are clearly Buddhist, clearly Taoist, or clearly Confucian. There's no, con no um, co combinations there, but they're all specializing in one particular area of knowledge. And so just like it's possible for somebody in academia, let's say, to have a multidisciplinary specialization, you could major in law and in um, biology, why not? It would be difficult, but there's nothing to stop you from doing it. Similarly, some people could learn both traditions and therefore carry both hats. There, it's not something that is um, uh, a priori. There's nothing wrong or impossible with that. Um, and I think that an important aspect of this is the idea that all three of the traditions are understood to be Inc incomplete in some sense. 
that none of them is entirely all-encompassing. All so all of them recognize that there's something else in the other two traditions that you can, um, that you can learn from. And so when we look at the priests or the specialists in Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, in this idea of the unity or the harmony between the three teachings, all three of them, they consider that theirs is the best by far. Right? So the Buddhists definitely consider that the Buddhism is higher than Taoism and Confucianism, but they see that there is value in those two as well. Similarly, the Taoist will have the same view, and the Confucian will have the same view. So all three, from their pers perspective of the specialist, they really they do believe in and see the and consider theirs to be the highest one, but all three of them in that sense also have a mutual recognition that they all have something to bring to the broader picture. And for most people who are not professional specialists in any of these traditions, they go, they find whoever is most knowledgeable, most capable in what their needs are. And if that happens to be a Buddhist, they'll go to a Buddhist. If it happens to be a Taoist, they'll go to a Taoist. And if it happens to be a Confucian, they'll go to a Confucian. Now, the emperor is also a player in this because the emperor um, has want, wanted to um, uh, ensure the harmony of the society and to ensure that conflicts between these different traditions would not arise. Uh, in fact, there have been conflicts uh, between Buddhism and Taoism, between Confucianism and these other traditions uh, in Chinese history. They, these traditions have not loved each other. Um, and so the emperor has wanted to promote and even impose this notion of the unity of the three teachings in order to ensure the harmony of the entire society. So we, uh, and so this, uh, and and it should be said that this model of pluralism is one in which these three teachings coexist within this one triangle. In other words, outside of that, uh-uh. You know, any other teaching would not be uh, permitted. So it's not an entirely open type of pluralism. It's one where just those three have each found their own place, their own function, and learn to cohabit with each other while the common people of all social strata have learned to use, uh, have learned to make use of these different systems of knowledge. Now, around all those, so we can see that people can freely uh, turn to different, uh, different of the, these different systems. However, all of them share a certain set of common values. And these common values maybe are not necessarily formally institutionalized, but they form, in a sense, a common oil or a common um, atmosphere within which this whole system of these three teachings, these three institutionalized teachings, operate. And we could just identify some of these common values as, first of all, practical morality. So in, in, a strong emphasis on moral behavior and really thought about in a practical sense, not in some abstract philosophical sense of uh, ethics, but really in terms of how can, I, how can I deal with people, how can I be a good person in my everyday life, how can I, how can I um, evaluate or assess other people in their dealings with me on the basis of morality. So that is one common value. Another one is the centrality of the family. Another one is harmonious social relationships. And another one is holistic flourishing. And by that I mean is uh, seeking for um, flourishing or prosperity at all levels. So from material wealth to family, you know, happy family relations to uh, spiritual fulfillment, um, at all levels. So um, all of these, uh, this is so in a sense an idea of holistic uh, flourishing or holistic prosperity. And so these values then um, are uh, commonly shared in a sense by everybody within this system. Although in each of these specific teachings, those who specialize in them may not entirely adhere, they might have something different. So for example, in Buddhism, to be a Buddhist monk, there is, uh, you know, 
leaving the family, right, chu jia, to become a celibate monk. So this violates certain common values about the family. Uh, Taoism has also, in some practices, which may violate some of those common values. So those are, for people who are really specialized in those traditions, there are certain aspects which are not necessarily in line with those common values, but overall, among all the people, and even in the way that religious specialists of those three traditions deal with the common people, everybody is operating on the foundation of those common values. So this was just one of the models of religious pluralism that I wanted to talk about. Now the next one, uh, it's a completely different way of looking at things, and this goes back to the civil and martial um, idea that, uh, that was expressed in the ritual that I showed at the beginning of the talk. Now here I will just, uh, okay, I'll go to, to another presentation here. All right, but I will. All right, here we are. Okay, now in this, um, so in the tradition that we saw here, uh, we had a cosmological, so I mentioned that there was a, a civil altar and a martial altar. And each, those two altars, uh, in a sense, express a certain set of cosmological relations. Uh, the civil altar is yang and the martial altar is yin. The civil altar is north facing south, the martial altar is south facing north. The civil one is Buddhist, as I mentioned. The martial one is Taoist. Now, one, okay, and um, there are a number of other associations which I don't have time to get into in detail, but in a sense, it's a very Levi Straussian kind of thing where you have these two opposites and the whole ritual brings them into, uh, into uh, contact with each other. But I wanted to stress one aspect here, which is the universality and locality. So the, the, the civil altar, represents universality in the sense that there were, it was the three jewels of Buddhism which are universal to Buddhism and have nothing to do with any locality. Um, and whereas the martial altar had all the local deities and each of those local deities, some of them are highly localized, even exist only in that particular area and they all have their own very local histories. Each deity has its own story and often is actually somebody who used to live, who, uh, a prominent person who, uh, like a saint, who actually lived in that area a long time ago. And so um, uh, what we have then is these, um, a, a dynamic interplay between the universal and the local. And uh, there is a tension between the universal and the local. The universal, the Buddhist part, the civil part, is considered, even by local people, to be the more dignified one, to be the more proper one. Um, uh, and even the priests themselves, as I mentioned, they can play both roles, but they consider the civil one to be really the correct, the, 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 the more proper one. Whereas the martial all, they, even local people, they consider it to be, it's a little weird, uh, it's a little uh, xie, as they say. Uh, which means, yeah, a little crooked. Um, there are some inversions there. So actually the, the priests pray, the, they're actually uh, playing the role of a woman. Uh, there's comedy in some parts, so it's not serious. It's, it's more movements. And so um, it's not, even the local people, they don't, they consider it to be not so proper. And the priests also, they consider, oh, that's easy to learn. So everybody considers that the, the, the martial altar is not as good as the, or somehow less uh, distinguished than the civil altar. However, the local people like going to the martial altar. They're always there watching, not at the civil altar, which is more boring. So, um, so what we see is there is a tension there. Um, and in China, throughout Chinese history, there's always been a tension between uh, uh, um, a civilizing culture coming from the center, a universalizing culture. Um, and here it's, it's exemplified by uh, Buddhism, but in some cases not. It could be more exemplified by Confucianism or even another sect of Taoism. Um, but there's always that structure. So, but what's important here is that although the there's that tension between the universal and the local. Um, and the universal is in conquering the local, so to speak. But nonetheless, there is that place for the local. It's not excluded. And in fact, it is integrated into the entire structure. 
And so um, uh, you have, in a sense, then, the, the way that Taoism and Buddhism are integrated into this ritual structure is really part of a, of a broader unit which is composed of a more universalistic tradition and one which is uh, more localized and seeing how the relationship between them is played out through this ritual and in fact how it is played out in general in, in Chinese culture. To use, um, whoops, actually to use another, I mean not civil martial, the civil martial dyad is actually a very deep concept in China and we're not gonna, no time to really get into depth uh, into it. And another maybe similar structure that we can see in Hong Kong where I live, it's not, it's not about civil martial, but it is about that joining together the universal and the local into, in a sense, one system, is actually the interplay in Hong Kong between Christianity and Chinese religion. Where I teach at the University of Hong Kong, um, most of my students in their families are um, engaged in <coughs> Uh, the practices of Chinese religion, uh, folk religion, what we call. So uh, the f at the family, they worship ancestors at home. Uh, on grave sweeping festival in the spring, they go to the tombs to worship ancestors. They go to temples uh, on Chinese New Year and so on. So all of these practices of, of Chinese religion. At the same time, many of them have gone to Christian schools because in Hong Kong, most schools are uh, at least half of schools are Christian, and so they became Christian. And most of the elite in Hong Kong are Christian. So what we see is this universal tradition is there, Christianity, very strong in Hong Kong, and at the same time, people are practicing the local traditions, um, and in fact, Jiao rituals, similar in structure to what I just showed you in the new territories. And so these two are actually both there simultaneously interacting. And so my students, uh, most of them have, uh, uh, are experienced in both. Um, and so the, there is, in a sense, this um, universal and this local, which are interacting together within one uh, social system. Now, a third um, model is um, what I would call the inner and outer cultivation model. Uh, the nei wai, nei gong and wai gong. Uh, and this is uh, one structure that I've seen among a group of, uh, in a sense, a, a wave of, um, uh, of new movements uh, which have come out of Chinese religion in the early 20th century. And many of these groups came out of one tradition, which was called Xian Tian Dao, the way of former heaven. Now, former heaven, in a sense, is a purely uh, pre-created spiritual realm. That's the meaning of the former heaven. It's a Taoist concept. And uh, this, uh, this tradition is, is, is really, in its core, is um, based on Taoist cosmology and Taoist spiritual practices. Now, in the early 20th century, many different religious movements kind of came out of, uh, of that Xian Tian Dao tradition. And what's very interesting is that if you look at them from the outside, well, they, uh, some of them are uh, presenting themselves as Confucian, others are presenting themselves as Buddhist, but actually they even, and many times even consciously, they have a distinction between the inner and the outer. So the inner cultivation at that level is going to be Taoist. And so certain elements of um, Chinese uh, Taoist cosmology and practices of um, inner cultivation, inner spiritual cultivation, are really at the core of all these different traditions. And yet on the outside, depending on a different social context and different um, needs and also different um, uh, forms of legitimation, they actually present themselves in a different way. So one of them, for example, uh, now is very large in Taiwan, and it's mostly active in society in promoting the study of the Confucian classics. So it really presents itself with a stronger Confucian identity. 
Another one in Hong Kong, uh, it actually it runs schools, and it so it's outside. It's Wai Gong. It's this is used to be called the Dao Yuan, and uh, it in the early 20th century it was called the West. The, it had an outer charitable arm. So in its dealings with society, it really engaged in charity and philanthropy. So it was called the West Swastika, the Red Swastika Society, kind of imitating the Red Cross Society. And so it has schools and all kinds of charitable activities. So that's how it, it interacts with society. But the inner core, the cosmology in its inner practices and its uh, uh, most inner writings is, again, it's the same Xian Tian Dao, uh, Taoist cosmology. Um, in Singapore, I went to a temple of the, this, this same tradition of Xian Tian Dao, but when you go into the temple on the ground floor, it seems to be purely Buddhist. It's Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy, and so on. But then you go upstairs, and then in, in there, it's uh, about the Taoist cultivation. And so in Singapore, because most of the people really are more Buddhist in orientation, most of the Chinese people, and so that's how they presented themselves at the outside. Um, now another group, uh, an offshoot of this tradition that grew into a large movement in Vietnam actually has um, a almost like a Roman Catholic um, external presentation because of the influence of French colonialism and the strong influence of the Catholic Church there. So here we can see that in this inner and outer dynamic, there's one where of re remaining faithful to a certain deep inner spiritual core, and then in response to different social and political contexts, uh, then kind of reaching out to the, the needs of the people and also to um, political or broader social requirements of legitimacy by having a different outer presentation. So this has just really been a very simple exposition of different ways of thinking at, thinking about how do you bring together in a structured way different systems of knowledge, different systems of belief. And so I think we should really, um, this might make us think about how can we think about the, uh, the emergence of uh, the construction of composites. And this is also something, now I really, all these examples that I used are from traditional Chinese religion. But I mean, they can also be used to consider, for example, the relationship between Chinese and Western culture. Today, China is a society which is thoroughly Westernized, and yet which is also deeply Chinese. And so we're no longer at the stage of seeing which is better, Chinese or Western, but in what way do the Chinese elements of Chinese society and the Western elements of Chinese society, how do they form a composite uh, in which these two civilizations are in relation with each other? And it's something for the whole world to think about as China expands its influence throughout the world. And so it's not a question only for Chinese, but really when we look at the emergence of global civilization then. Um, how can we move beyond a pluralistic idea that we, rep we respect each other's civilizations to think about, well, how can we see we're all part of one civilization in which each of the different, each country, uh, each um, large cultural area has become one constituent component in interaction with the others. Similar when we're thinking about science and religion, rather than seeing them as two completely exclusive domains in conflict with each other, which perhaps can only learn how to tolerate each other, uh, how can we see them as forming a composite of elements in relation with each other? Um, and again, the, secular, the sacred and the secular. Um, the sociologists and philosophers are talking about how we're move the the project of full secularization of society has not really has has not succeeded religion and faith in the world is is coming back so how do we how do we see the relationship between the se sacred and the secular and rather than seeing them as in conflict with each other or learning simply to respect each other what kind of composites of dynamic composites can be formed between the sacred and the secular. So in that sense, if we're thinking about 
world peace, how can we see peace as the formation of a new composite, not, as the ab not simply as the absence of conflict between two units, but as the formation of a new body composed of diverse elements in dynamic relation with each other, so that in the end, the whole world, perhaps, can become a turtle <laughs> in which the square and the circle have been squared and circled together. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, so I'd be glad to discuss this now. Uh, yeah, um, uh, discuss it or uh, answer any questions you might have. Yes, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, for example, if people talk about Taoism, it doesn't really necessarily talk about um, Laozi, the founder mm -hmm. of, of the religion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, versus the, like the West, like people, if they talk about religion, they also talk about the founder uh, of a, a religion. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can, you, can you just repeat that? Yeah, so okay, right. So the question is, why is it that the Chinese, okay, I think what you were saying is that actually the Chinese have a very practical approach to this. And so the question is, why have, wh what is the cause for this very practical approach? And is one reason because, um, well, in the religious sphere, for example, in, um, uh, in China, they don't really have a strong relationship with, let's say, a, the prophet uh, at the center of each religious tradition, whereas in the, in the West, um, that that is uh, that that relationship is far more important. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a very good question, but I think the question should really be turned around. In other words, as an anthropologist, I would say that the attitude you see in China is not unique to China. That is the actually the the baseline human attitude, which is to uh, you know because actually, if we go to Africa. If we go to countries which have not been under the long-term influence of Christianity or Islam, actually it's the same kind of attitude. So I think this is the baseline attitude, is that people uh, at the onset, people are practical and they want to, uh, and so they want to find the best way to solve their problems or to find their answers. So the question is then why, it's the other way around, why did something different happen in, um, uh, in uh, the Euro-Islamic sphere? And I think it does relate to your, the answer that you suggest, but it's not the question of um, simply that, oh, because they have a, let's say, a strong relationship with Jesus or with Muhammad, but it's the fact that strong religious institutions have emerged in these cultural spheres, which have told people that if you, if you believe in Jesus, you cannot have, you cannot, you must reject the other ones. That's the difference, right? Um, now in China, religious institutions have been very weak historically, so they have not been able to impose their, um, they have not been able to impose that kind of exclusivism. Um, uh, there may have been tendency to do so if they had actually, if one of them had been dominant, but they have been unable to do so because the religious institution has been very weak. But the question is really that strong and uh, exclusively dominant religious institutions have emerged in the Christian and Muslim world, which have told people that if you, if you turn to one, you must reject the other. And, and that's the difference. So there were, you know, in, in one of my um, religious, um, I have a class on religion at the University of Hong Kong, and um, we I actually showed to challenge students. I showed a video where um, there uh, there was a, a Muslim who who made a great YouTube video. He's a singer, and he is all about how he believes in Jesus. So it's in a kind of rap, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. And it's just a wonderful uh, expression that as a Muslim, he believes in Jesus. 
Um, but uh, anyway, you know, there's some debate that some Christians said, well, yeah, but Muslims say that Jesus is a prophet uh, and not, uh, you know, uh, not the son of God and uh, this and that, very minor theological differences. And then one of my students said, well, can't, can't, he be, can't Jesus be both a prophet and a son of God? And, um, you know, but some people would say, no, you know, he can be only one or the other, and you must reject anybody who has a different view. So that's the cause. It's religious institutions which have promoted a very exclusive view of religious affiliation. Yes. Uh -huh. where uh, Taoism, the official ritual uh -huh. of state Taoism originates. And then I also went to uh, um, a Christian church in Guizhou, mm -hmm. which is completely packed. People all standing in the back. And then I heard a lot of stories about uh, Buddhist you know, um, priests. Right? So it's like there's a big momentum for making money, you know, out of religions in China. Like mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I heard a story about the Taoist, the Buddhist priest, you know, now driving fancy cars, yes. you know, like uh, yeah. riding in luxury trains, and then they got like hundreds of millions, you know, out of like the, the pious like believers. So what do you think of this? You know, it's really interesting. Like like uh, the religion that's for belief, and then the religion that that's now for money. Um, it, it seems to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, um, so that because you have been to China recently and, and been to uh, Longhushan, one of the mountains in China, which, which is actually one of the main centers of one of the branches of Taoism, uh, and, uh, and also been to churches, and so you can visibly feel the revival and the growth of different kinds of religion there. Um, but there's, the question was about the... Um, the commercialization of some of these religious practices. So uh, the Taoists were charging a lot of money to enter the temple, uh, and Buddhist monks are now known for their luxurious lifestyles. Uh, the Christian, however, the Christian church, that's free. You don't spend money to get in there. And so she was just asking about, about this phenomenon. Yeah, so I think this is actually a, um, a, uh, a big... Um, um, uh, it's actually a big question and a big uh, topic of debate now c uh, currently in China uh, that much uh, religious activity is um, there, are, there, are, there are strong commercializing tendencies. And so I think actually I was suggesting in this, in this talk to look at forms of uh, composition uh, and even between the secular and the sacred. And another question that I forgot to mention is also to look at what are the implications and the consequences of different types of composition. So you can compose different things in different ways, but then what's going to happen as a result of that? And so this is really a question that is open for discussion in China, where the, co the, comp the, the combination of the spiritual and the material, uh, there are many different ways of combining it, and it, it does have different results. So um, um, uh, Buddhism, for example, um, has a certain way of, of, um, of generating good uh, karma by donating money to temples. So the more you donate, that would be said to generate better karma. So that way a temple is quite, uh, uh, generates enormous amounts of income. And so a temple can be a real, uh, so monks now, uh, many of them uh, have, uh, re are reputed to be living very uh, luxurious lifestyles. Uh, Taoism, uh, a lot of the practices of Taoism are instrumental, uh, uh, as they are seen among the common people, uh, are instrumental or health-related in a sense that it's easy to package them and sell them um, as a product. And so that... So there, right, so there is this, this commercializing uh, tendency which exists in Taoism. And um, Christianity, however, or many of, those, um, uh, many of the Christian churches, they don't, they don't 
combine it in that way. So uh, there they have a strong distinction between um, the pure faith and material life. Some of the churches then say, however, if you enter the church uh, in a pure way, however, that will lead to you becoming, you know, materially wealthy later on. So there are all these different ways of looking at this combination, and, and that's a really serious topic that I think a lot of Chinese people are very concerned about. So how do we combine the um, material prosperity uh, and uh, spiritual growth, and how does a religious group itself deal with that? And uh, we can see in China as a laboratory, you have all the combinations that you, you will be able to find. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, right, so that's a very good point. So one of the, so the tendency of uh, commercialization of religion in China now is also uh, uh, partly as a result of government policy. So, because government policy now is largely focused on economic development and is still trying to, f uh, it is not very, um, is still very uh, worried about the development of religion. And so if a religious group can uh, participate in economic development, uh, then, um, right, then, uh, then, then that's okay. So there's the saying, um, uh, uh, right, uh, jing, what is it? Jing ji da tai zong jiao chang xi, right? Uh, the, so the economic platform, or is it the other way around? Shi zong jiao da tai jing ji chang, bu shi zong jiao chang xi, huh? Yeah, so it's the, the, econ the economy is the platform and then religion is, uh, economy is the stage and religion is the actor on the stage. So welcome to religion to uh, play on the economic, contribute to economic growth. But then that's kind of uh, twisting or creating a pathway for the development of religion which then strengthens the, um, the material, uh, a focus on material development uh, to the detriment of, uh, you know, and so for some religious groups and religious traditions, that leads to, uh, it, it can lead to a weakening of its spiritual foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned about China's role in, in building civilization and its, mm -hmm. How 
would it help its, its, the implications for that in responding to that, and also then how that could perhaps provide an example to the rest of the world of how mm -hmm. to deal peaceably? <coughs> Um, well, yeah, actually, so that's a very good question, and um, um, actually, I, I gave a uh, earlier version of this talk uh, in China, in Shanghai, uh, a few months ago, and it was after that that I added the part about common values that I talked about, because that came out of the discussion there with uh, Chinese scholars there. And actually, what the question you uh, just raised was really one of, the, uh, one of the topics that people were discussing a lot. And basically, I, sent, I think the, the idea was that um, as for um, religions uh, coming from the outside, the key is that they are able to find that to, uh, to um, accept the foundation of those common values and also this attitude of, op of uh, openness to other traditions. And that the, um, uh, even though, uh, for example, uh, Christianity, for example, is growing very fast in China, very fast, but there still is a strong sense of um, concern among others uh, that in spite of all the actually Christianity is a lot of very good things to bring to China and many people recognize but then there is a there is a sense of worry about that that there uh, a worry about a, a stronger tension between certain um, certain forms of Christianity or certain approaches more exclusive uh, in Christianity, which either do not tap into that common uh, value system or to that a greater uh, that that more attitude of greater openness, and so and so often people have said that that's the key, that's the question for a religion coming from outside. How can it solve that problem? Now Christianity, for example, has been grappling with that for a few centuries, and so um, and certainly. Um, uh, um, there is one approach which really does see the, really roots itself in the common Chinese values and really sees Christianity as an embodiment of those common values. <coughs> so, but that's really where the point of, uh, which really needs to be worked out um, for, a lot of, for a lot of Chinese, I would say a lot of Chinese intellectuals when they look at what's going on, yeah. and I'd like to thank you, Professor Palmer, very much for a very intriguing talk.